Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, everybody, to our busy morning here as we initiated our before service coffee and donuts, and it's our rally day. So it's great to see all of you here. Let us come, let us be gathered in, and let us worship. Good morning. Would you please stand for our call to worship? On the journey of life, Christ goes with us side by side. While we gather here for worship, may our lives be focused with praise and care. As we humbly sing, prayer, pray, and listen, may God's Spirit deep within us come alive. And may this time of worship be for us a constant God. Now let us sing with joy and spirit. As we serve and live and share God's amazing love. Please join in hymn 111, How Can We Name a Love?
please join in our opening prayer. O oh God, as we gather this morning, help us to worship you sincerely, follow you faithfully, and grow in your grace and holiness each day that we are given on this earth. May we be held in our faith and daring in our service to the end that we help bring about your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. I want to invite up our young disciples for young disciples' time. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> All right. Did everybody start school? Is everybody excited about that? Yeah? <laughs> Don't they look excited? <laughs> so when you start school, what do you got to bring to school? What do you got to bring? What do you got to bring? Huh? A caset. Okay, I don't know what a caset is. <laughs> oh, the big binder thing. Yes, that did not exist in my day. So that's a new word for me. I didn't know what a, I didn't know it was called a caset. Thank you. What else do you bring? A good attitude. A good attitude. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> what do you bring, Charlie? <laughs> yeah, pencils and rulers. So do you guys have something like this? Do you have something like this? What is this? A little pencil box, yeah? I took this from my son's desk. I better get it back. This uh, to him. So look at it, we have tape, and you have highlighters, yeah, a protractor, color pencils. Do you guys have stuff like this? And then what's on here? Do you see what's written here? A name. A name. Do you guys write your name on stuff? Why do you put your name on your supplies? Why do you put your name? Yeah, so you know who, whose it is. Did you want to say something, George? What did you want to say? A snack. Well, you can't forget the food. That's right. You put your stuff on your supplies because it's important, right? And they're useful, and you need them. Well, as you guys start your school, I want you to know, do you guys, you guys are marked? Do you know you're marked? Now, you may not see it, but you're marked by God's love. Because you know what? Just like this, you guys are even more useful than what you have in your school supplies. And you want to know something else? You're even more important. So I want you to know as you go to Sunday school and you go through this year of school, I want you to know as you reach for your school supplies and they're all marked with your name, I want you to know that you're, you are marked by God as a child of God. And I want you to know every single day you are useful, you are important, and more than that, you are loved every single day. So let's say a prayer. Oh, God, we thank you for the beginning of our Sunday school, the beginning of the school year. What an exciting time. I pray for all these young disciples as they move through this time and this journey. I want them to know that, that they are marked by your love as your children, that they are so useful, so important, so loved, not just by their families, but by this church family that embraces all of them and loves them all so very, very much. Be with them, O oh God, and watch over them and keep them safe and help them to have an amazing, amazing school year. Amen. All right. As they head out to Sunday school, I invite all of you to stand and share the peace and love of Christ with each other.
Thank you, that was beautiful. Our New, les our new Testament lesson this morning is, is from the book of Philemon. It's a letter by Paul and Timothy to Philemon, a leader in the Colossian church, and it's entitled Paul's Plea for Onesimus. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is, it is not, none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. Thank you. Our gospel lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew. It's there in your bulletin. I invite you to stand as we hear our gospel lesson read this morning. Hear these words from Matthew's gospel. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. May God add a blessing to our hearing and living out of our readings this day. You may be seated. <clears throat> As I was growing up, my father had a knack for finding and fixing just about anything. Um, anytime something broke, I would always go to my dad, and before I knew it, he would have it fixed especially with bicycles. I've tried to follow in this tradition. I'm not as good as my father in fixing things. But since I have three older brothers, and I'm the youngest, I always got the hand-me-downs. Those of you who are youngest in your families, I'm sure you can relate to getting the hand-me-downs. And uh, not just with bikes, but with clothes, with pretty much everything. And my brothers rode their bikes hard. So it seemed like every week I was coming to my dad with one problem after another. To me, the bikes seemed completely useless. But those useless bikes in the hands of my father, who with some great duct tape, some screws, a lot of ingenuity became useful again, at least for a little while. Of course, everyone knows that with a bit of duct tape, anything can be useful again, right? Have you learned that lesson in life? But does that work with people? Can we be made whole with some strategically placed spiritual duct tape? Can we find meaning and usefulness in our lives with the right turn of the screwdriver to our soul? No, I'm afraid. Even duct tape and screwdrivers have their limitations. I'm sorry to tell you. There is, however, something that can heal our hearts, turn our lives around, give us focus and purpose, and help us to see just how useful we really are. And that's our faith. It's our relationship with Jesus Christ. And it did that for a runaway slave named Onesimus. It did that for the Apostle Paul, and it's doing that for us right now. The book of Philemon is an interesting book. It's probably a book we hear quoted the least. Out of all the books of the Bible, it's probably the book we read the least. It's just one chapter, and it's just a very simple letter. It's not a letter to a church. It's a letter just to a person, and that person's name is Philemon. The book probably doesn't turn heads because of the subject matter. It's about a slave. Actually, it's about a runaway slave named Onesimus who had stolen something from his master Philemon, and then he ran away to avoid being caught. Now, I should say briefly that slavery in the Roman Empire at the time that Paul is writing this letter is not like the slavery that we think and picture in our heads when we think of the 18th and 19th century of this country. Slaves like Onesimus were not considered property. They had basic rights under the law, and the vast majority of slaves worked their way into freedom, and some even became very, very, very successful landowners. However, given all that, the penalty for stealing was still quite severe. So Onesimus ran, and in his flight, he came upon Paul. Some might think that's a coincidence, but I read some wise words once that said, a coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. So of all people to meet, it was certainly a God moment for Paul and Onesimus to get to know one another and to develop a relationship. During this time, Onesimus and he became very, very close. Paul recognized that God was at work in this, in this man's life who was running away. And so 
Paul went about developing this relationship with Onesimus. He, he pointed out the mistake, the, the sin of stealing, of running away, and then followed that up with the good news of Jesus, that he had already paid for what Onesimus had done. As a result, Onesimus was not only converted to the faith, as we find in this letter, but he became a trusted and a reliable helper to Paul. This man who had run away um, now lived up to his name, since Onesimus literally means useful. So Paul, in this very short letter, is writing back to Philemon and telling him that Onesimus is now more than a slave. He's actually not a slave anymore. He is now a true brother in Christ. And he is sending him back to Philemon and urging Philemon to forgive Onesimus and free Onesimus and help Onesimus in his work that Paul has given him. As Paul writes, I am sending him that is my own heart back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but as a beloved brother. And Paul finishes by stating, formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. You see, even when we feel useless, God still has a use for us. As a pastor, I often sit with people who, because of age or injury or sickness, feel useless. They start to feel like they're a burden because they can't walk the way they once did, they can't see the way they once did, they don't have the strength they once did, they don't have the mental faculties they once did. For whatever reason it is, they begin to feel that they just weren't, they're just not the same people they once were. I sit with people who, because of depression or because of mistakes they made, they feel unworthy, they feel unlovable, they feel useless to everyone around them. I sit with people who struggle with their faith and wondering if they're really making a difference in this world. There's nothing, nothing worse than feeling in this life than the feeling that you're useless or the feeling that you're unloved or the feeling that you are isolated and alone. And I tell these people that God does have a use for them. God is a use for all of us because we are forgiven and we are loved as children of God. So what about us? Do we extend that same forgiveness to those who hurt us, no matter how hard it is to do? Do we ask for forgiveness from those we have hurt? Do we realize the depth of what Jesus did for us on the cross to forgive our sins, our mistakes, to give us a new and an eternal life? Do we realize that what transformed Onesimus, what made him useful, what makes us so useful is not any skill or talent or special ability, but it is at the core our faithfulness and our trust, our willingness to accept the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and to share that radical love. Tradition says that Onesimus was indeed freed by Philemon when he returned, and that Onesimus went on to become a pastor of the church in the city of Ephesus. But then he later went on to become the bishop of his region. Onesimus found his use in letting his light shine before the world, and we have the same opportunity this morning. Because so often we think that to be useful, we need some special knowledge, or we need some special ability, or we need to accomplish great things, or we need to be in perfect physical, emotional, or spiritual health. But I want you to hear this morning that none of these are true. Being useful is about being faithful. It's about letting God use what you have to offer. And Jesus is our model in this. Again and again, we see Jesus with the people in his day who had a label ascribed to them, and the label was useless, unworthy, outcasts, the sick, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the Gentiles. To each of them he went at great criticism, at great cost, and he welcomed them, and he healed them, and he fed them, and he loved them, and he called them around him to be his disciples. For each of them he looked beyond the label that others had put on them, and he saw them for who they are, children of God, full of value and use, deserving of a new life. And the joy and the good news for us this day is that Jesus sees us in the same way and calls us to see the world through his eyes.
So I heard this story about a name named Guy Dowd, who was the class sponsor in Brainerd, Minnesota. It was prom season, and he had an idea for a special kind of dance. Guy wasn't a, a fan of traditional prom dances, and his experiences as a teacher, he saw lots of kids feeling rejected on this night. That it was actually a very sad night for some kids, because they didn't have a date. And he saw that for many kids, it became just this big popularity contest, focused too much on clothes and, and looks. So he decided he was going to put on a different kind of dance. So he planned a dance for people over the age of 75. People who he knew in his experience, don't, they don't often get invitations to things like this, let alone get invitations to a dance. So a month before he set up the dance, he sent out an invitation to all the the senior homes in the area. You put it on the radio. Everybody over the age of 75 is invited to the high school for a dance, and the word went out. So the night of the dance came, and it wasn't supposed to start till 7.30, but by 6, this bus pulls up from the senior living community. And all these ladies come out, <clears throat> and they said, well, we understand there's supposed to be a dance here tonight. So by 6.30, the place is filled. As it turns out, there's more women than men. So they went out, and they went to the football team. They said, you know, don't go home. Shower, put on your clothes, doesn't matter, come in, we need you to dance. Then they had to call more members of the junior class to come to get more people, especially guys, because they were running out of them. Because all the older men that were there were getting tired, so they needed more ones. So the place became packed with these older adults and these young high school kids, and they danced and they danced and they danced until midnight. And when it was all over, these young people came to Mr. Down. and they said, this was the most fun we've ever had. This was the best dance party we've ever attended. Because you see, this night wasn't about who's popular and who had a date and who didn't have a date. This was a night for these youth and these mature adults, these two groups who can really struggle with loneliness, being overlooked, struggling with health issues, whether it's eating disorders or addictions for youth or arthritis and heart issues for seniors or mental health issues for both of them. This was the night where everyone was invited to come and know you're accepted, you're useful, and you are important. So of course, when you think of it, this is God's kind of party. Because this is what God does. He brings in people. He brings in all people. People who might not get invited to much of anything or who may feel rejected and lets them know, here is a place for you. You see, that's the kind of community that Jesus came to create. In our gospel lesson, we hear this parable of the wedding banquet. And when we hear about the kingdom of God, what you are supposed to picture is the kingdom of God is a party. God loves parties. That's what Jesus did. He invited people who were overlooked and rejected and put down and bullied, those who may, have felt, who may not have felt useful or wanted, and he invited them to come to the party, to come and experience the joy and the love and the hope found with him and through him. And that's our mission to this day. In so many ways, we can be like Onesimus, Runaways at times, afraid or lonely or hurting or struggling or tired or just plain stressed out. But in the midst of all that, we're loved and we're useful and we have a purpose. And there's a power and a Savior who loves us and forgives us and gives us hope and calls us to this party and calls us to invite others to come. He calls us out and he says, I need you. I need you to walk with me and, and use what I've given you to share my grace and my forgiveness and how you act. I need you to encourage those who are struggling with a letter or a phone call or a visit. I need you to work for justice and peace in your neighborhoods. I need you to pray each day. I need you to share your love and your faith with the people you meet because in so doing, they can have this relationship and the joy with me to know that we are needed, to know that we are useful, no matter our age or our physical condition, no matter what's going on in our lives, we are useful because we are a child of God, because Jesus died for us, because we don't need tremendous talents to make a difference in someone's life. All we need is a trusting faith, where we tell and we show another person, and we mean it that Jesus loves you because that's powerful and that's meaningful. That's the message that changes and allows hearts and minds and souls to be transformed. That's what Paul shared with a man named Onesimus 
and changed his life. You know, as a child, I looked forward to helping my dad fix bikes. It was neat to see how an old bike was really never use, useless. That even though it had some dings and it had some dents and it wasn't perfect, it still had a lot of use left in it. And that is what our faith reveals and what I challenge each one of us today to realize. We may not be perfect. I, most of all, stand before you saying, I am the least perfect person you will ever meet. And I have lots of dings and lots of dents. How wonderful that through the grace of Jesus Christ, I and all of us are useful tools and vessels and servants of God's love. I invite us this day to go forward boldly and joyfully with the work and the challenges that God has set in front of us, no matter what our life is like. Let us go forward to invite others to the party that God is holding, using all our gifts and all our skills and all our blessings of God to love this world completely and fully as we together bring forth the kingdom. Amen. Let's stand and respond as we sing in the faith we sing. Bring forth the kingdom. Amen. Be seated. I want to invite you in your uh, bulletin. You have a little pink insert. It says, Commissioning and Blessing of our Campaign Cabinet. We've had a wondrous group meeting over the summer. And uh, today we're going to commission and bless the work that they've done. I want to invite up Jim Wells, our um, campaign coordinator. And he comes to us from Sun Prairie, from the Wisconsin United Methodist Foundation. So welcome, Jim. Thank you. Good morning. good morning. I learned today that you should start with a good attitude. <laughs> so greetings to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I bring you greetings from the Wisconsin United Methodist Foundation. 
And I bring you greetings from Edgerton United Methodist Church, where I'm a member and where my wife is a pastor, where they are praying for you this morning. The uh, Wisconsin United Methodist Foundation has been invited by your leadership to uh, work with your church on the, a combined general fund and capital campaign to seek new and renewed commitments from each family and household in this church to help raise funds for building maintenance for needs that are both immediate and long-term so that uh, you may continue to move forward in your faith journeys. The campaign's theme is Steeped in Tradition, Reaching for Tomorrow. I'm the uh, Foundation's Capital Campaign Coordinator, and I really love my job. I get to go to churches like yours to help raise the most amount of money that they can for building and remodeling projects, for debt elimination, for new programs, and to support ministry and mission throughout the state of Wisconsin. It's a real opportunity for me to uh, see people responding to God's gifts by making sacrificial and life-changing gifts to their congregation through campaigns like the one you're starting here, or that is underway here, I should say. The Foundation's goal as a partner with you in this venture is to be positive, to be challenging, and to make sure this is a faith-growing journey for each one of you. We want your church to succeed in this special calling that God has presented to you. You'll be receiving some mailings over the fall, and my advice to you is please read those mailings. Open them immediately. I know there's a tendency, even in my household, with a pastor and a, and a professional in the United Methodist Church to put, put it on the stack. So these are going to be time sensitive, so give them a read, please. Today, you and I are dedicating the combined campaign cabinet. Uh, these are members um, who have been called specially by God for this job. And they have been very dedicated and enthusiastic leaders, have been meeting in the quiet, on the quiet over the summer. And uh, they have been ably led by Connie Bouquet, whose middle name should be Onesimus. And um, I am going to invite her up here now to introduce the members of the cabinet, and then Pastor Tim will lead us in a dedication. Thank you, Jim, and thank you all for, for being here and listening. You know, when when we're called, sometimes it's not convenient. And this is a year for me that this call was clearly not convenient. I'm in the middle of, of changing households. Not an easy thing. But I could not refuse this leadership role. And I'm glad I didn't because the people who have responded, as always in this church, any time we have a mission and a ministry, the people of this church family step up. 26 people thus far have accepted roles in this campaign. Some have been very active through the summer, um, dedicated to helping prepare the way for the rest of us to be responsive this fall. Others have accepted roles that start now and will, will carry us through to the end of the, the campaign in November. I would like to call folks, everyone who's on the, the campaign cabinet, I'm going to call, and if you're here, please do come up, uh, but for all of us, those who can't be here today, are equally a part of this effort, and we look forward to having them work with us. Spiritual guidance and growth has been led by 
Randy Leroy and Bill Church. Please come on up. Communications and promotion have been led by Ginger Ayers, Susan Caldwell, Marsha Schwager, and Dane Schuler. Lead gifts have been led by Joel Hoffman and Glenn Van Fossen, who of course is off teaching our young people this morning. Fellowship has been organized by Mavis Luther with the help of Joanne Bartell, Jenny Bertoloni, uh, Shelley Burns, Janice Church, Katie Jackson, and Debbie Leroy. Calling, which will begin soon, was started, it is being led by Sandy Christensen, Ann Miller, Nancy Gruner, Joan Bushman. Children and youth liaisons are Peg Gardner and Olivia Peters, both of whom are preoccupied today. Production is Shirley Campbell, Kay Schrader, Herb Ayers, and Duana Charrington. And our auditor will be Karen Huffman. Jim, pastor, this is us. <laughs> Aren't they good looking? <laughs> so we're going to go through and, uh, and commission these people. Dear members and friends, of our church family. We are about to launch into a marvelous faith adventure of commitment and sacrifice. Our goal is to raise as much as possible to secure funding for some immediate repair needs as well as funding an account to take care of future building and maintenance and repairs. At the same time, we're securing pledges for our 2018 operating budget and the challenge is great. To provide leadership for this campaign effort, a number of members of our congregation and others have been asked to serve on this combined campaign cabinet. They have agreed to share their time, their counsel, their unique talents and abilities, and their personal commitment and sacrifice to make this faith journey possible. Today we recognize the ministry of these persons, and today we consecrate them to this special task in the service of Jesus Christ. I invite you to join with me in these words of dedication for this campaign cabinet um, and our congregation. So on the screen or in your insert, let us pray together. We lift up each of the persons named as a part of this campaign cabinet and invoke God's blessing upon them in the weeks ahead. As we celebrate the leadership this group of leaders will bring, we also dedicate our own lives to this effort. We commit to following their lead faithfully, saying yes if asked to help, and responding gladly when we are invited to lay our own gifts and commitments upon the altar of the Lord. Thanks be to God for the opportunity to be part of this exciting faith venture to which we are called. So let us pray. Almighty God, look with favor upon these persons who reaffirm their commitment to follow Christ and to serve in Christ's name. Give them courage, patience, and vision, and strengthen all of us to create in this place a community of love and forgiveness where all may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. Amen. Let us congratulate as we bless. <laughs> You're all blessed. Yay. <laughs> there are a couple reasons we brought everybody up. One was so that you could see that this campaign that we're launching beginning October 1st and running through the whole month of October and ending with our big celebration Sunday on November 5th wasn't just done by a couple people in a back room. I wanted you to see the people you trust of this congregation that are leading this effort. The other thing is that if you have questions, like something doesn't make sense to you, did you see all them? They would love to talk to you. <laughs> you see all of them, you know their names, you know their faces, you know them all. If you have questions as we begin this on October 1st with our kickoff through our month of October and ending November 5th, these are the people. They love, they would love to have conversations with you one-on-one, -on -one, over coffee. Invite them to dinner. So, talk with them. Pray for them as they continue leading. Well, we come to be a people of prayer now. And I want you to lift up, if you have joys, to praise and thank God for concerns of your heart that you have for friends or neighbor or the world around us. Um, I want to invite our ushers to um, hand out mics so we can hear one another and 
those who are recording the service for can hear you. So what are your joys this day? What are you thankful to God for? What are your concerns that you have? So Rick, right down here. <laughs> and we'll go back to you. <laughs> Thank you. This church has always been mighty in its ministry and its interaction with the community. Uh, and one of the programs, one of the many programs that, have, uh, that has launched this fall is the new Belcanto Senior Singers site here in Mequon, United Methodist Church. And it's meeting from 10 to 1130 on Wednesday mornings. It is going to be a wonderful opportunity for fellowship, for music making, for the therapy and joy of singing together. So if you uh, missed the first rehearsal last, last Wednesday, which was a blast, there were eight people here and uh, singing, singing their hearts out, um, I'd like to see 16 this Wednesday and maybe then 32 the next Wednesday. <laughs> Please join us and know that in singing together, we are ministering to our community. Thanks. And you can also invite others to join too. Yeah. So Kim. Um, prayers of concern for my two kids that live in Sarasota, Florida. They're on the Gulf Coast and um, Hurricane Irma is headed there today. Yeah, we pray for all those in the path of Irma. Yeah. And I also have a prayer again. I'm offering up my nephew, Terry. You all know he's had health issues in the past, and tomorrow morning he is undergoing some hip surgery. So I think he needs some prayers. All right, our prayers with him. Ginger. Um, kind of like Kim, I'm standing before you being really, really anxious. Um, I have a racing heart and I have uh, kind of emotional issues. Now some are really good as we're here for joys and concerns. All of my kind of anxiety over joys of Sunday school starting and the picnic after church today and our uh, campaign starting, those are good things. The anxiety as Kim, as Herb's niece and nephew are half a mile from the Gulf Coast in Cape Coral and have decided to weather the storm in their home. So in this kind of mixed anxiety, I went looking for some kind of comfort. Yeah, I probably should have gone to the Bible, but I went to Google instead. And, and maybe God directed me because I came across something that had nothing to do with comfort. Um, it had to do with kind of the rules we can live by, whether we are um, anxious for good things or bad things, whether it's joys or concerns. These are kind of rules of life that will guide us forever. So bear with me. I just would like to read you the list, and maybe something on it will speak to you today. Laugh a lot. Never give up. Keep your promises. Say please and thank you. Have fun. Try something new. Forgive and forget. Dream big. Be gracious. Always tell the truth. Do your best. Give second chances. Pray and pray again. Say, I love you. And lastly, always, always cheer for the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> All right, yeah, <laughs> Marilyn. <laughs> um, I have a couple of joys and a concern. First of all, I've had my friend's uh, daughter, Danielle, on the prayer chain for over a year. She's 27 years old, diagnosed with breast cancer. She's gone through two rounds of chemo, radiation, and surgery, and as of last week is cancer-free, so thank you for your prayers. Um, the other is adding, again, to sort of the Irma thing, Dave and Diane Bedrin. Um, so prayers, they are here in Wisconsin. They obviously have a home in Naples they're concerned about, but more importantly, Matt Bedrin, who all of us know, who grew up in the, the church, he and his uh, girlfriend, his fiance, had gave birth to twins on Friday. Two boys, very healthy, but they are in Tampa. 
and the hospital has advised them to stay in the hospital. They felt that at this point that is, they're hoping, the safest place for them to be. They were not able to evacuate because of, of the babies. So prayers for them. All right. Let's see, Doug, right here. <laughs> this is an odd request from me in that I don't know the person that I'm asking prayer concerns over. Presently, we have a contractor in our kitchen working on removing asbestos. We were asked by the contractor to put him on our prayer chain. He's a big man. He's looking at a gastric bypass. In order to have this operation be successful, he's already lost 100 pounds. The scripture that comes to mind here is the centurion who saw Jesus, asked for guidance and help for one of his people, and when Christ said, let's get the person in here and we'll talk about it, the centurion replied, if I command a person to do something in my organization, they do it. If you command this man to be cured, that will happen. And it did. So I ask prayers of concern for Bill Cook, a man I've not yet had the pleasure of meeting and have just dealt with over the telephone. And early this morning, he asked if I was going to church, would, would he be included in our prayers? So that's an act of faith that's, we, we should do that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We pray for Bill. And seeing, yep, Marilyn. Um, I just want to say welcome to Tiffany. <laughs> and uh, we've had Tiffany's uh, parents on our prayer chain, and mm -hmm. I hope things are, con are continuing to be good. It's great to see Tiffany, and we're praying for your parents, for you. All right, other joys? Could, yeah, right here. Good morning. I just wanted to have uh, uh, a joy this morning for Frida Jefferson, who uh, celebrated her 89th birthday yesterday. All right. <laughs> Happy birthday. Other prayers? Other joys? All right. Well, with all these, let's pause. Let's pray. Oh, God, we give thanks for this time to come, to gather, to be your people, to know just how much we are loved and, and useful, to know that you are such a strong part of our lives. We come this morning and lift you all these prayers, especially the prayers of concern, those that we are worried about for members of our church and, and loved ones in the path of Irma, and we pray for their, for their safety in this time, as we also remember those who are recovering from the hurricane that hit Texas. Oh Lord, we pray for your comfort and for your peace in this time. We pray, O oh Lord, for those that have been lifted up that are sick or injured, and we pray for your healing presence to surround them. We pray for those who are grieving losses and for your peace to be with them. We pray for our world, O oh God, and, and we give thanks for those who hear your call to serve, to go forward and to share your love and your grace and your hope, to let each person know just how useful and important and loved they truly are. For we truly are a blessed people, O oh God, so help us to have open eyes and hearts to see all our many blessings, blessings of family and friends that surround us, of our prayers, of your presence that works through our, through our lives and our world, bring healing and wholeness for our church family that walks with us and prays for us and for your son, Jesus Christ, who has died our deaths and risen for our sake and who calls us to be by his side, to be in his mission, inviting all people to the great and grand and glorious party of hope and of faith and of joy. Oh, Lord, we lift you these prayers, but there are others on our hearts. So we pause just for a moment 
to let your Holy Spirit speak to us and nudge us in this time of silent prayer. O oh Lord, as you've heard our prayers both silent and spoken, hear us now as we join with one voice as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, a few announcements. So today we have our Rally Day celebration and picnic. So I hope you enjoyed the coffee and donuts in the parlor. There won't be anything in the parlor after church. It's all going to be downstairs. And then we're going to eat. So I hope you'll all stay. We have some wonderful food. We also have gluten-free options. So if gluten is an issue, we have those options for you downstairs. So come, let's be together as a church family and fellowship for our picnic. Choir practice starts tonight at 7. We need you. <laughs> Come sing. Tai Chi, Mondays and Fridays at 11. Our children's ministry fall program. We had a great, a lot of fun going to Norway. Now we're going to go to Peru in September and the first Sunday of October at 4 and then dinner for everybody at 5.30. And our lunch bunch is meeting every Tuesday at 11. That's our new study on half-truths. And then we have our delicious lunch at noon. And you're all welcome to be a part of it. This week on Thursday is the men's prayer breakfast turn. And so, men, this Thursday at 7 a.m., I invite you to come to begin our month with our simple meal and devotion and uh, communion together. I do invite you to read through the bulletin for our other announcements that are here. I want to invite our ushers forward to collect our morning offering as we give with open hearts and hands and our wonderful uh, quartet of youth for our gift of music.
Let us pray. O God, for all the blessings of our life, we give you thanks and praise as this day we return them to you. Return our gifts and our hearts with open hands, knowing that in them they are surely multiplied and put to good use as we share your grace and your peace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's join in our closing hymn from the Faith We Sing hymnal, The Spirit Sends Us Forth to Serve. And so let us go, you beautiful, beloved people of God, so useful. Let us go to share God's grace and hope and peace as we close our service with go in the peace of God. Thank mm -hmm. you.